In this video, we are going to look at the enthalpy and the entropy changes that are involved when we take an ionic compound such as sodium chloride and dissolve it in water. And we can start with the equation NeCl solid plus Aq, that just stands for dissolving in water, to form the ions in solution. And this enthalpy change is the enthalpy change of solution. So delta sol H and our little bus stop sign. Now, we can think of dissolving in two steps. The first thing that we need to do is we need to break up our lattice. And this is something we're familiar with, the lattice enthalpy or lattice energy for an ionic compound. So I can turn this into a Hess cycle or an enthalpy cycle. So step one, we break up our lattice to form gaseous ions. And then step two, we take our ions and we hydrate them. In terms of enthalpy changes, here we have our lattice enthalpy for sodium chloride. And on my second arrow, I have got two enthalpy changes. I've got the enthalpy of hydration for a sodium ion and the enthalpy of hydration for a chloride ion. The value for my anion and my cation are going to be different. So we've got two enthalpy changes for step two. Okay, before we go any further, we need to clarify the term lattice enthalpy or lattice enthalpy for an ionic compound. Now, at A level, pretty much every specification states that this enthalpy change so the lattice energy or the lattice enthalpy for an ionic compound is actually the lattice energy of formation of an ionic solid. So if we're forming an ionic solid, then this term refers to the reaction, in which case we have um, a sodium ion, or anion, a cation, reacting together to form the ionic compound. And that's going to be a highly exothermic process. It's going to be negative. However, I think it's really important that you're aware that apart from A-level specifications, pretty much everyone else in the chemical world recognises this term to actually be or refer to the amount of energy it takes to break up a lattice. So the reverse process. So our solid going to form ions in the gaseous state, in which case it's going to be a highly endothermic process. It's going to be the same value, but endothermic rather than exothermic, positive rather than negative. Now, it's important that you're aware of this because if you go outside of your textbook to gain clarity about lattice energies, it's really easy to get confused. So bearing that in mind, I am going to take lattice energy as per an A-level specification since this video is aimed at uh, clearly A-level students. In which case, on my enthalpy cycle here, going from sodium chloride solid to the ions in the gaseous state isn't the lattice enthalpy, but the reverse lattice enthalpy. So I hope um, that that's clear now. OK, let's move on to look at the enthalpy change of hydration for anions and cations, which is this term here. Now, hydrating iron involves a number of water molecules, typically between four and eight, directly coordinating themselves around the anion and the cation. And we assume that when that happens, that the sodium ion and the chloride ion are electrically neutral. They can no longer feel each other's opposite charge. They're no longer attracted to each other. This here is my primary hydration shell. And we find that the water molecules involved in the primary hydration shell also affect their near neighbours, binding them more tightly than they would be in the free solvent, and so forming a secondary hydration shell. 
Now, once we have our anion and our cation floating around in solution with their hydration shell, I like to think of it as the floating around with a little duvet of water molecules around them, this whole kind of unit moves as one, which means that ions in solution appear much larger than might be expected. Let's take a look at group one. If we were to look at the trend in ionic radius of a lithium ion down to a cesium ion, as we go down the group, the actual ionic radius increases. However, if we dissolve our lithium ions and our cesium ions in water, the effective ionic radius has the opposite trend. The effective ionic radius of the ion plus its coordinated water molecules and essentially its hydration shell actually increases as we go up the group, not down the group. Why might this be? Well, if we think about lithium ions and cesium ions, they both have a one plus charge. But lithium ions are much, much smaller than cesium ions. So in lithium, that one plus charge is concentrated. In cesium, that one plus charge is spread out over a much larger ionic radius. In posh language, we would say that lithium has a high charge density. And a cesium ion has a low charge density. And this is going to affect the number of water molecules in the hydration shell of a lithium ion compared to a cesium ion. What we actually find is that lithium ions generally have 22 water molecules surrounding them in a number of layers. Cesium ions, on the other hand, only have around six water molecules are in their hydration shell attracted to them. So, in effect, in solution, a lithium ion turns out to be a much larger unit than a cesium ion. So, the enthalpy change of hydration for an ion is directly proportional to Z squared over R, where Z is the charge on the ion and R is the radius. So our enthalpy change of hydration is going to become more negative exothermic as the radius decreases and the charge increases. Because as the charge density of the iron increases, we're going to get more iron dipole bonds formed between our iron and our solvent. We can plot the enthalpy change of hydration against Z squared over R for a number of cations. And the kind of pattern we see, the trend we see, looks somewhat like so. Individually, I could plot the values and I would find that silver ions, sodium ions, lithium ions are up at the top. And then maybe barium ions, calcium, magnesium, scandium, which has got a three plus, vanadium with the three plus, you get the idea. The ions, as you can see, generally actually fall into groups based on their charge, but within each group, the smaller the ionic radius, the more exothermic the enthalpy change of hydration. So we can see that here. Silver is really quite a large ion. It's got a very low charge density. Lithium still only got a single positive charge but a much smaller ion, slightly higher charge density, more negative enthalpy of hydration. If we increase our value of Z, because remember it's Z squared over R, then we can see that with a two plus charge and then with a three plus charge, that has a big effect on how exothermic our enthalpy of hydration is. However, hydrating ions isn't just all about enthalpy. We also need to consider the entropy changes that happen when gaseous ions dissolve in water. 
Once again, if I were to plot the entropy change of hydration against z squared over r for our individual ions, we get a plot that looks like so. We have ions like potassium, silver, sodium up here. Again, they tend to congregate in groups depending on their charge. We can see copper down here and the Fe2 plus ion. And then ions with a 3 plus, we would see down here on our plot. So what's going on? How do we explain this? Well, I want to start with this bottom group. For most ions, the entropy change from going to the gaseous state to an aqueous state is negative. If the entropy change is negative, that is not favourable. That's telling us that our water molecules are becoming more ordered or less random around the ions. And we know this is going to be the case because for each of these ions, aluminium is a good example, it's a small ion with a high charge. It's got a really high charge density. So it's going to attract lots and lots and lots of water molecules in hydration shells around it. So the solvent molecules, the water molecules, are becoming much more ordered. We've got a negative change in entropy. So how come for our larger singly charged ions, those with a low charge density, there's actually a positive change in entropy. This is telling me that when I dissolve an ion in water, the water molecules are actually becoming more chaotic, more random. What's going on? We need to remember that in pure water, we have got an extensive network of hydrogen bonds between our water molecules. And this has the effect of restricting their movement. Now, when we dissolve ions in water, some of these water molecules will form hydration shells. And that has the effect of disrupting the network of hydrogen bonds. However, our large, singly charged, low density cations only coordinate with a very few water molecules. So the decrease in entropy we're going to have when a few water molecules form a hydration shell around one of these ions must be outweighed by the overall increase in entropy arising from the disruption of the hydrogen bonded network of water molecules. So overall, we're seeing a small but significant positive entropy change when we dissolve some ions in solution. Well, if you remember, we can break this down into steps. First step, reverse lattice enthalpy. So we take our lattice and we break it down to form ions in the gaseous state. So that would look like so. And then we can take those ions independently and hydrate them. In terms of our enthalpy changes, we're going to need to know the lattice enthalpy. So that's minus delta Le for our ionic compound. And we're going to need to know the hydration enthalpies for the ions independently. So we're going to have a value for the hydration of a calcium ion and a value for the hydration of a nitrate ion. And we're going to require two of those because calcium nitrate contains two nitrate ions. This is an example of an enthalpy cycle or a Hess cycle. We can also show the same thing 
on an energy level diagram. Some people find it easier to think in those sorts of terms. So what would that look like? Here we go. We could start with our solid calcium nitrate. We know that if we want to break it down to form ions, so that would be calcium 2 plus in the gaseous state and two nitrate ions in the gaseous state, then in A level speak, that is going to be our reverse lattice energy. Hydrating those ions is an exothermic process. So reverse lattice energy is endothermic. We need to put energy in to break up our lattice. But in terms of hydration, to form calcium 2 plus aqueous plus 2 nitrate ions aqueous. And that is our enthalpy of hydration for calcium and separately for the nitrate ion. And that was times two. Sometimes we see this energy level diagram with an extra step. They treat it more like a born harbor cycle. So we would have another level. So we would take one to be, say, the hydration of just the calcium ion. So on this level, I would write Ca2 plus aqueous plus 2NO3 minus gas. And then the second step is converting the nitrate ions from the gaseous step to the aqueous step. This, of course, is our enthalpy change of solution, the enthalpy change that we're trying to find. And for calcium nitrate, I'll give you the heads up, it's exothermic. Whichever way we do it, whether we do it via an energy level diagram or whether we do it via a cycle, our overall calculation is going to be the same. Uh, let me find a blank space. Here we go. So, enthalpy change of solution is going to equal the reverse lattice energy for calcium nitrate plus enthalpy of hydration for the calcium ion and the nitrate ion. I'm not going to fit this in. I'm going to go down here. 3 minus. And that one needs to be multiplied by 2. Let's have a look at some numbers. Well, the latter enthalpy for calcium nitrate is minus 2188 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so we are breaking up the lattice. So it's going to be endothermic minus minus 2188. The enthalpy of hydration for a calcium ion is minus 15. Seven, nine. And for a nitrate ion is minus 314. And that is times 2. And when you plug that into your calculator, it comes up with a value of minus 19 kilojoules per mole. So we know now that the enthalpy change of solution for calcium nitrate is exothermic, so that's favorable. We can also look up the entropy change of solution for calcium nitrate, and that turns out to be plus 45. Uh, sorry, I'm going to get my units right. Plus 45 uh, joules per Kelvin per mole. So it's positive overall. That is also favorable. So whichever way we look at it, when we put these two factors together, Calcium nitrate is readily soluble in water. If this has been useful, hit the subscribe button, the effortless way to support your studies. And by clicking the link in the blurb below, it will take you straight to the Crunch Chemistry School, where you'll find all the resources you need to get that A-star grade at A-level. Together, we can do this.